Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. Welcome to day five of the 11th multi-stakeholder partnership meeting of the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock. I'm Shirley Tarawali, I'm chair of the Global Agenda and uh, Assistant Director General at ILRI International Livestock Research Institute. I'm talking to you from Kenya. Just a few housekeeping announcements first. We will be recording this session. If you have any problem with that, please make sure you let the organizers know. Um, you can access interpretation. If you are in the conference room listening to us, which I hope you are, um, minimize the screen and you will see an option for interpretation. You can find interpretation in Spanish or in French. And if you would like to select one of those, you need to mute the main feed from the conference stage. That is my voice at the moment, so that you hear only the, the, the translation. In that same area, you will find a Q&A box. And we really want to encourage you to use that, not just to ask questions, but to post your comments and thoughts, anything you'd like to share with us in, as we go through today's session. So again, a very warm welcome. Thank you all for staying with us through the week. Welcome to anybody who might be joining for the first time. I hope you found it a rich and rewarding time and I really encourage you do stay engaged as we go forward. Today, we actually have a shorter session than we've had for the rest of the week. Uh, and we'll be summarizing the journey that we've been through this week. We'll hear about a couple of those global processes where there's great opportunities for the livestock sector to engage. I just mentioned the Q&A box that you can find on your screen. And we'd like you to use that as we go through this session. You can ask a question of the presenters and if we have time at the end of their sessions, we will ask them. Eduardo's gonna help me with that. But we also want to hear from you. Do you have a specific action or an intervention that we as the livestock sector, not, not just cattle, needs to be doing in the next few months, 12 months or so. What do you think should, should be a specific action? And do you have feedback on this meeting? Its focus, its process, what you liked and what you perhaps liked less. So keep those comments coming through the Q&A box and Eduardo will help us to uh, share what, what we've heard and seen through that as we go through this session. Let me now welcome our first speaker, Nancy Bourgeois-Luthi, who is with the Bern University of Applied Sciences in the School of Agriculture, Forest, Food and Food Sciences in Switzerland. Nancy is also coordinator of the research and academic cluster of the Global Agenda. We tasked that cluster to make a summary of this week, really because they did it so well last time, and I think they've done it really well this time as well. So with that, Nancy, I'm going to hand over to you to give us the summary for the week. Over to you, Nancy. Thank you, Shirley, for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, global synthesis, which I will present on behalf of the academia and research cluster, as uh, Shirley mentioned. So this is a challenging task to summarize uh, four days of very rich and intensive discussions. So what did we do this week, looking at the passionate and happy faces of the people here? Um, we did what Gazel uh, is meant to do and as well, we, um, as a multi-stakeholder platform, it shows evidence, it does concrete actions, it is based on a dialogue, it participates in processes, it is global and yet diverse. So here you see the program of the four last days. I will not go into the details of the programs, but I will give a summary for each day and the main activities and the salient features of every day. So on the first day on Monday, uh, Shirley and uh, Henning Steinfeld set the scene for this meeting. 
and expose the push and pull factors of changes, among others, the accelerated structural changes, which happened because of COVID-19. Among others, the call for change from the Food Systems Summit, alternatives to animal source food and climatic concerns are among these factors of change. This calls for healthier diets, more resilience, a strengthened One Health approach and climate action. The diversity was also highlighted as a strength, a diversity of resources, of systems, of species, of people, cultures, etc. And the role of Gazel to address these changes are to participate in processes like the UN Food System Summit Independent Dialogue, to reach out to new stakeholders and to communicate in a nuanced way. On the first day, we also had the first regional meeting or rather the sub-regional meeting presenting the case of uh, French and Swiss Jura. On the second day, this was the day of the regional consultations report, 10 of these uh, regional consultations. And taking a farm to fork approach, I exposed here the, the most or the key points or most salient features of these regional consultations. Starting from the farmers, these consultations highlighted once again the importance of smallholders and family farming for resilience. They highlighted also the importance of land tenure and land rights, especially for pastoralists. And I believe that this land issue is uh, coming up quite importantly this year compared to other years. These consultations also highlighted the role and value of grasslands and all areas not suitable for crop production, but suitable for livestock production. They highlighted the role of mixed systems and the symbiotic relationship between plants and animals, and the fact that livestock is key to sustainable systems. It also showed alternative ways like silvopastoral systems, regenerative agriculture, sustainable agricultural intensification, or examples like free range production for monogastrics and organ organic production. It addressed as well the feed no food issue or the importance of keeping marginal areas or grassland for livestock production and the cropland for crop for food production. It addressed the preservation and the need to make better use of local animal genetic resources. It also um, highlighted the fact that the One Health approach needs to be strengthened. It discussed the measurement of efficiency and resilience the need to find additional indicators or new indicators. There was also some debate about the, the role of efficiency or the measurement of efficiency. It highlighted uh, in many places the, the term local, so local markets, short value chains, but also the, the need for local agendas and local actions. Yeah. It also showed the importance in some context of labels and the importance of remunerative production, the economic returns for livelihoods, all important aspects for smallholders to survive. And moving downwards or downstream the value chain, it, it also showed that there is a, a large disconnection between producers and urban consumers, and this disconnection needs to be bridged. It also showed the ability for livestock to actually tell stories, which can inform consumers about food, nutrition, but also about other roles. It also showed that uh, the affordability of high quality protein, which is provided by different livestock production systems. And finally, coming to the end of the value chain to the consumers, the ones who actually drive the, the value chains, uh, the role of education starting at primary and secondary school level 
to communicate benefits of animal source food and to continue for all consumers group. And a very important issue also, which was tackled many times uh, during the week was the food waste issue, the need to address this uh, pressing issue. And this shows actually the need for, in the enabling environment, the need for science-based and inclusive policies to acknowledge, support, incentivize, promote and build capacity on nature positive production, which comprises crop and livestock. It also highlights the need for education and capacity building for all actors of the food system. So not only consumers, not only farmers, not only processors, but everyone. And finally, still in the enabling environment, it shows the importance of communication based on science and the need for compelling narratives. And finally, it also showed that there is a commitment from Gazel for a progressive improvement towards sustainability. And progressive is an important term in that regard, avoiding disruptions. So this is only a few highlights from these very rich um, inputs from the regional consultations. And I believe it's the second year we do these regional consultations in this form. And this is really uh, a very um, useful and, and rich um, way of getting information and sharing information with the different settings in the field. Finally, this highlighted that livestock is part of the solutions and not only a problem as too often viewed, it is part of the solutions. On day three, we move to the field, if we can say so, with the action networks. So seven action networks presented their um, activities. And these action networks, they work with various actors of the food system. And here, a few highlights from these uh, activities. So action networks provide evidence, they document practices, for example, with case studies, they develop and they test measurement frameworks and tools. For example, we saw the example of dairy economic, social and gender empowerment impact, the multifunctionality of grassland um, framework, the efficiency matrix, the resilience assessment indicators, among others. These action networks also communicate evidence and good practices through publications, seminars, for example, a seminar on resilience, on the rational use of antibiotics, among others. They also communicate, for example, LEAP on the catalog of application, mainstreaming evidence-based solutions. And finally, for the ones who are involved in, uh, in teaching, through lectures to students. The future actions of these action networks highlighted during this week is the need to tap more into synergies of all action networks. In other words, to increase the transdisciplinary collaboration within GASEL. There is still scope for improvement. Um, future actions as well to reach out and scale out, so outside GASEL and the need to tackle complexity through multidisciplinarity, multi-actors, multi-scale approach. And finally, interesting food for thought, which emerged from one action network discussion um, to discuss about the need to ultimately move from a resource transformation and consumption narrative to a resource sufficiency narrative. On day four, so yesterday, the keynote speakers and the, the panel participants discussed uh, several issues or several points, like the collaboration between Gazelle and other partners. So the collaboration is key to advance dialogue on livestock and to promote changes. A few examples, the COAG subcommittee on livestock and Gazelle so Gazelle can participate in meetings as observer and vice versa. Uh, there is also the opportunity to prepare information, documentation on Gazelle's activities, which can feed into 
the COAG subcommittee on livestock and to share field tested and validated good practices for smallholders. Another example shown for <laughs> CFS was to discuss with Gazelle how to promote CFS policy products to livestock community in future. For example, the voluntary guidelines on food systems and nutrition. And finally, private pub public partnerships uh, need to be explored also for further. Another highlight from this uh, panel discussion was the fact that the livestock sector has been underfinanced and that invents investments are still low compared to the crop sector, for example. Livestock is part of the food transformation. This is clear for us, but we need to make it also clear for others. And finally, a nice statement, I think it was from Nitya Godge from India, that livestock is more than the sum of its products. The second part of the afternoon yesterday was devoted to group work. And here I selected or we selected a few outputs of this group work, uh, which was also a very rich session. So in the four sustainability domains that we use, um, the groups working on livelihoods and economic growth found a need to improve capacity to innovate for farmers, but also for other stakeholders and also for Gaza. And a call for policy changes in all domains of livestock. In the food and nutrition security group, there was a need, a need identified for more detailed and differentiated research, which is tailored to the context. To expand the membership to other stakeholders, as already mentioned in other uh, sessions of this week, and to include, for example, human health actors, consumers, but also to integrate uh, or better integrate underrepresented groups such as farmers, women, and youth. The need to fight food waste was also addressed in this group as in other session this week, and also to deal with the issue of access to ASF, to animal source food. In the health and animal welfare, a need to identify local standards that are currently in place was identified and also the need to improve extension mechanisms and exchange of knowledge, like a platform for farmers. And this is actually one of the few times where extension was mentioned and discussed. And personally, I believe this is a very important point as it tends to be often for forgotten. Finally, in the climate and natural resource use group, the need to put together evidence and practices, including traditional practices, and for example, how to uh, deal with livestock and wildlife in the same place uh, was mentioned. Then methodologies to need to be developed and shared to measure emissions in smallholder systems. And also in this group, extension services were mentioned, which should be based on holistic view of the farm. So this, again, are only a few uh, silent features of these very rich discussions in this uh, group work. Now coming to the end of this synthesis, you may remember for the ones who attended the, the meeting last year that we came up with this um, summary of the, of the tasks, key elements and key actions to do for Gazelle. This was last year. And actually this year, we kept the same way of highlighting it because we don't want to disrupt our activities. We work in continuity and many of the aspects which we tackled last year or discussed last year will remain the same. So this year we again will focus and strengthen the One Health uh, approach we will again work on resilience aspect. We will again keep the holistic approach and the systems approach. But we, this year we, more, we focused more in depth on these systems and the comp components of these systems. So the need to speak and work with smallholders and pastoralists, the need to address the issue of their income, the need to address the issue of genetic diversity in livestock, but also in crops. 
the need to talk about these land issues, land rights. And finally, the need to keep in view that the mixed systems are actually part of the solution more than ever. And for the key actions, we also keep the same. We will continue to work as we did. But to embrace changes, we need to take new actions globally and locally. We need to make new connections. Gazel needs to reach out to more stakeholder groups from the society, like consumers, social scientists, journalists, human health actors. We need to communicate livestock multifunctionality and roles in a balanced and nuanced way. We need to address the negative sides of livestock production, but we need to highlight the positive ones. There is a strong call in general for coordinated action within and also outside Gazel. And to harness diversity, we acknowledge the diversity and the complexity of these systems. There is no fit for all solution. This makes changes difficult, challenging, but this is the reality of the field and of the producers. So with this, I thank you all and I give back to Shirley. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. That's a really, really impressive compilation of the week and your final image well I couldn't help wishing that we'd all been able to come to Switzerland what a beautiful picture to close that great presentation we thank you so much to you uh, as well as to the team that worked with you to, to bring that so nicely together and and really give us something to build on as well um, Eduardo do we have anything in the Q&A nothing yet Surely nothing yet. We don't have. Let me keep encouraging people. If you have something in the Q&A you'd like to share with us, please do. I have a small question for Nancy, um, which you may defer if you wish. Um, I realize there's quite a big emphasis on smallholders, on pastoralists, and that's really good <laughs> to see. Um, I almost had a sense it's like a pendulum that's swung that way. And I just wanted to make sure that in doing so, let's not leave out the more um, industrial, large scale, commercial scale operations as well. Gazel covers everything. Um, and I think it's really important that we do that because we know that's part of the, of the diversity. That is the strength of Gazel. So I don't know if you had a comment on that, if it was just a reflection of the of the composition or what? Yeah, that's a very good point. And my guess is that it's maybe because with the COVID in many places, the, the role of local production and family farming and smallholder production was maybe more prominent or highlighted more prominently. And maybe over the past years, it, we tended to not to forget about smallholders because we know they are here and they are the backbone of agriculture worldwide. But um, maybe in some, in some areas there was more or in the past few years, there was a bit more focus on larger scale production, maybe also because we were in Kansas two years ago. And um, <laughs> I don't know. And so maybe it's, uh, it's just bringing the smallholders a bit more to the front, but you are right. We should, actually, we should not forget that agriculture is diverse and in scale. And, and we need all forms of agriculture. It's, it's not, there is no discussion about one form being against the other. Perfect. And yeah. in future, even more, as we have to feed more people. That's right. Yeah, we, we, need, all, we need all of it. And, and as we've said, and you had on one of your slides, I think, diversity is, is a strength. I'm guessing, Eduardo, no more questions, comments, anything you have to share with us? No, no more questions. No, no comments. Okay. Folks, I hope you're out there. I can't see the number of people. Um, please do post, let us know you're there. Uh, as I said earlier, share with us if there's something you think the livestock sector should be doing over the next few months. If you have a feedback on the meeting, we'd like to hear from you. Uh, or if you have a specific point in relation to any of the presentations that, that you're hearing. 
But I think with that, we will uh, move on. And we're going to have a couple of short interventions to highlight some of those global processes important for livestock. Nancy already mentioned this, the need to communicate well beyond the livestock sector. We're gonna hear about the, the COP26, particularly the, the Coronivia process. And we're gonna hear some more about the forthcoming opportunities in relation to the UN Food Systems Summit. So let me first welcome Walter Oihan Kabel, who is advisor to the Minister of Livestock, Agriculture and Fisheries in Uruguay. He advises particularly on policies of adaptation to and mitigation of climate change in agriculture. Walter is also the official negotiator of agriculture issues under the United Nations Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC and is a lead reviewer of greenhouse gas in inventories for Annex 1 countries for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Sorry, Water has been a real champion of livestock in his engagement with these various processes and with the COP26, particularly the Coronivia process, which he's going to tell us a little bit more about now. So, Walter, over to you. Thank you very much, Shirley, and good day to everybody. Uh, I have a, a presentation to share, which I will do now. I hope you all can see it. Yes? Is it on the screen? Can, can you see it? Yes, Walter, it's, we can see okay. it. Okay, then, then I start. Well, I, I, will, um, I will tell you about this process of, of Coronigia and uh, where we are now in, in direction of, of a COP26 decision that uh, increases and enhances the, this process. Um, it, it is absolutely clear that food security depends heavily on climate. So we are cons very much concerned about the impacts of climate change on, on food production and food security. And we also are concerned about the, the, the role uh, of agriculture in contributing to, 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 to mitigation. In this regard, uh, I highlight that in 2017, during COP23, uh, Coronivia Joint Work on Agriculture was created. And this is particularly important and it's a kind of milestone because uh, Coroni uh, agriculture is, is the only sector to have an agenda item in the, in the negotiations of the Climate Change Convention. Uh, and, and this is due to, to the importance of agriculture for food security, this is due to the particular vulnerability of agriculture to, to climate change. So it was uh, really an outstanding result. And um, Coronivia puts to work together different bodies of the convention. Uh, the the SABSTA, which is a subsidiary body for science and technology, and the SBI, that is the permanent body for implementation of the convention and to work together with a different, uh, what that are called the constituted bodies and financial entities of the convention. Uh, for example, the Green Climate Fund, the Adaptation Fund, GEF, and other constituted bodies as the Center of Technology, the Nairobi Work Program, well, there, there are uh, uh, several uh, constituted bodies and, and the merit of Coronivia is that tries to coordinate the work of, of all these bodies and uh, in, in, in line with, with the needs of, of, of countries. In, in particular, it focus on how to improve implementation on the ground, very close to the farmers. Uh, it is important also to be aware that FAO has been very close to this process and has provided a lot of support to Coronivia 
uh, through documents, through analysis of submissions by parties, through facilitating non-negotiation meetings, which were very useful. So FAO has been a, a, a very important partner for, for Coronivia. And um, it includes adaptation of life to, to climate change, as well as obtaining co-benefits in terms of mitigation and others, as one of its, its main topics. Uh, Coronibia started in 2017, as I said, it means some four years ago. And, uh, but it had been, agriculture had been uh, implementing a, a series of, of workshops before related to adaptation technologies and practices, early warning systems and contingency plans, risk assessment and vulnerability of agroecosystems, identification of adaptation measures, and practices and technologies for sustainable increasing productivity. After that, when Canadian was created in 2017, a new series of workshops uh, was included in, in, in a roadmap till 2021. And several of these workshops are very closely related to, to, to livestock sector. For example, workshop on methods and approaches for assessing adaptation, adaptation co-benefits, including mitigation and resilience. And this is challenges because the, 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 there is not yet a well-defined and agreed uh, methodology to assess if uh, we are improving the resilience or, or, or we're improving the adaptation of a system. With mitigation, it's easier because you have CO2 or CO2 equivalent, tons of, of, of gases, but with adaptation, is is, is much more complex. So there's a lot of work to do on, on this issue. Another workshop was on improved soil carbon, soil health and soil fertility on the grasslands, croplands, as well as integrated system and including water management. Uh, another workshop was on the improved nutrient use and manure management towards sustainable and resilient agricultural systems. Another one is specifically focused on livestock management systems, including agropastoral, silvopastoral, pastoralism. And finally, the last one was on the socioeconomic and food security dimensions, which is a cross cut into to all agricultural sectors. Well, Gasol has participated in the livestock workshop, sending a submission last year with its points of view, and uh, also speaking through gasol related speakers. And here you see uh, the, the, the front page of the, of the submission prepared by, by Gasol for, for Coronivia agenda item on, on livestock, which was sent on November 18, 2020. In summary, the, the Coronivia decision is very relevant for agriculture. It maintains a sectoral approach, including the relation to food security and the hunger and other SDGs, and a scientific and technical perspective. And Coronivia brings greater focus on implementing climate actions by creating what we call an enabling environment to enhance climate action in agriculture, including livestock as one of the, the main focuses of, of uh, working in, in agriculture. Um, as you have seen, the work done so far was has mainly consisted on uh, a series of, of workshops in which elements were brought to discussion. Uh, and now it is time to use these elements from the workshops to in our view, implement a work program that creates this enabling environment to uh, support implementation on the ground. Implementation is done by countries, uh, is, is a bottom-up process. So what Coronivia can do is not to implement directly for sure, but to create the, 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 an, an environment that facilitates countries in particular developing countries access what we call means of implementation, which is technology transfer, uh, capacity building, and finance with these three elements. 
um, the way forward for, for Caronivia is now the, the discussion. We, it, it, we have agreed what to do among all countries till, till the end of the roadmap of the series of workshops in now this year, it was going to be 2020, but due to the pandemic, it was extended to 2021. And now COP26 is an extremely important uh, uh, COP because it's the COP in which, uh, among other elements, of course, but in case of agriculture, it has to be decided how will Coronivia continue in the future. And in the view of, of Uruguay or, and, and several other countries, uh, the main results that we should achieve in COP26 in first place is to renew the roadmap of activities for the next years. This may include uh, new, new workshops for new topics that may arise. For example, topics related to how do we consider the, 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 the role of biodiversity in, in, in building resilience, uh, and how do we uh, achieve more co-benefits in terms of mitigation <clears throat> and, um, and many others that are still to be agreed. So uh, we are in the process, as I said, of, 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 of uh, identifying the, the new topics that should be addressed. And the most important thing would be to uh, arrive to a COP decision uh, related to the creation of, of this enabling environment that fosters implementation by countries on the ground. And the, um, so the challenge we have now is, is to agree on how we uh, create the institutional ar arrangements and we work with, with partners and uh, uh, FAO is a partner, World Bank could be a partner, uh, uh, Gasol would be a partner for, for Corenivia with the different constituted bodies and financial entities under the convention. So it, it, uh, it, it is likely that there will be uh, an invitation by the COP, or at least we are working to have this invitation to the COP in order to go beyond uh, the, the bodies of the convention because uh, agriculture, uh, climate action, food security are a, a very relevant task that ex exceed the, the, the possibilities of only one body of, of, of the United Nations. So we, we expect to have in, in November in COP26 a decision for uh, the future of Coronivia that makes it a, an important tool in, in support of uh, more ambitious climate action. So uh, in this scenario, livestock is going to continue being one of the main areas of work in Cornivia due to, to its vulnerability, to its GAG emissions, and also to the, the, the relevance of livestock for, for sustainable food systems. So one might say, uh, how could Castle continue being involved in the Coronavia process? And uh, I think Castle has, has a lot to, uh, to provide to, to the process of Coronavia uh, with, with elements that can be uh, included uh, in, 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 the, in the process of work. Uh, in these days, we are in the in, in, in the negotiations from the 31 of May to the 16 of June, every day we are several hours discussing among countries on, on the elements for, for, for the future of Coronivia. And it's not easy to, to find a consensus. Let me give, give you one example. In the, in the yesterday meeting, one, of, one, one country proposed that the solution uh, for for, for livestock in the future is to reduce the number of, of animals, to reduce the number of heads of cattle. Uh, because if they produce GHGs, then the, the, the solution is to reduce the number of cattle. Well, this is a, an example of, of the things we, we, we have to deal with. So how could Gasol be continue being involved in the Coronavia process? And 
in case Gasol decides to do it. I think that very important first issue is to give follow up to the process. This is a living process. This is a process that changes, and this is a process in which there is need to 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 follow closely uh, what are the the, the the new elements and, and how is, is is the process uh, uh, moving forward. So this is the one key element: uh, follow up to the process because it's not a static; it's changing a lot. Uh, Gasol should also become an accredited observer in order to participate directly on, on all the activities in which observers can intervene. FAO is an accredited observer, but Gasol would also consider the possibility to, to, to become an accredited observer. Another element is considering participating in COP26. And also in future COPs, because COP26 is, is one of a series, and, and, and this topic will be in the negotiations for, for a long time. And uh, it, side events are in, in the COP and an attractor of, of, for people to, to receive information and discuss and make questions and, and, and attend to presentations by different institutions. Uh, FAO has always been present in, 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 in via side events, and uh, Gasol could associate to, for example, to, to FAO or to other partners, and and participate in side events as already done in COP25 in Madrid. Another relevant opportunity is sending points of view on how Coronivia can better work in the future through submissions, written submissions that are regularly asked to be sent to, to, to parties and to observers and everybody, every, anybody can, can send their points of view. So it's, it's an opportunity, the send, sending a submission is, is an opportunity for the negotiators to, to be aware that Gasol exists and Gasol has something to say. So this is something that could be considered. And finally, there is also an opportunity, in my view, to connect with the UNFCCC constituted bodies and financial entities to offer inputs related to livestock, in particular knowledge, awareness of the importance of sustainable livestock system, uh, capacity building, provision of tools as the tools that LIP is, is producing. And uh, it is also, I think, an opportunity to to make uh, the constituted bodies of the convention and the financial entities aware of the existence of, uh, of, uh, of gas. Mm -hmm. In this moment, for example, the Green Climate Fund, which is the main finance window for, for climate action, uh, does not have a, a sectoral window for agriculture. And uh, the G77 plus China is, is is putting on the table the idea that the, GC, the GCF has a dedicated window for this. So this can create a place where countries can go to ask for resources for the national actions related to more sustainable agriculture and more, including, of course, more, more sustainable uh, livestock systems. So um, these are the, the main elements I brought to this meeting. I thank very much for the opportunity to, to share these elements with you. I, I myself, I feel myself a member of Castle, so uh, I'm very happy to uh, transmit this information and I'm open to any questions and comments now or in the future through the email, my email that you see on the screen. So thank you very much and I'm back to you, uh, over to you, Shirley. Otto, thank you so much. This was such a clear presentation. It was also exciting to see those examples of how, how Gazel, excuse me, could engage. And it was one of those presentations where every slide you presented, I had one or two questions and the next one that came up answered those questions. So perfectly done. Um, and thank you too for continuing to be part of Gazel and providing us with such a nice conduit to this really important process. 
Eduardo, we have a couple of minutes. Is there any question that's specific for Walter there? Yes, surely. And many other questions arrived a little late uh, and for the previous se section session. Yeah, for if Walter, we have time, we have... we'll go back to them. Yes, thank you. For Walter, there is a question here that says, Coronidia is so important. How can Gasol support the need for it to continue into the future from Brian Lindsay? I think Walter has referred to that anyway. I think you probably touched on it just in your last slide or so. Walter, do you want to add on that at all? Um, and I, yes, well, I, 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 I refer the, 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 the different um, opportunities for a, the approaching Gasol to, to Coronivia. Uh, as I said, uh, being giving follow, follow up to the process, sending points of view through submissions, participating in, in the COP, and also approaching the different constituted directly to the different constituted bodies that uh, are part of the, the institutional structure of the convention. The, the convention has created specialized constituted bodies and financial entities. The Adaptation Fund for, for Adaptation, the GCF for Adaptation and Mitigation, is the, the biggest financial window, but also constituted bodies that work on, on loss and damage, that work on an adapt on, on adaptation, uh, like the Nairobi Work Program, that is a platform to support, to provide information and adaptation, um, the technological mechanism. So th there are several uh, bodies and uh, maybe having a kind of strategy to, to approach uh, could be part of what I heard uh, that uh, um, Gasol should in, could increase the, its communication with the outside world, and uh, well, these these institutions and uh, bodies of the conventions could be some of the publics that Gasol could approach and offer uh, the inf the information that Gasol can can provide. Excellent, thank you. We're going to move on. Um, if we have time, we'll still come back to more questions and discussion. Um, and we've heard so many times this week mention the Food Systems Summit. So I'm really pleased to welcome our second speak speaker in this short slot about these different initiatives, who is Cynthia Mugo. Cynthia is Policy and Stakeholder Engagement Advisor at ILRI here in Kenya. And as part of her work in supporting ILRI's advocacy and communication, Cynthia has been spending a good part of her time uh, engaging in the processes around the Food System Summit. So she's going to share an overview and in particular highlight where there could be some entry points from the livestock angle. Cynthia, over to you. Thank you, Shirley. I hope you can hear me. We can. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and hello. So we are all well aware and are possibly involved in one way or the other in the ongoing preparations for the Food System Summit that's taking place in September. So I just want to remind us of um, the, what the summit hopes to achieve, which are five outcomes. The first is a statement of action by the UN Secretary General. This statement will capture what the summit has had in its over one year of engagement. The second outcome will come out of the ongoing member state um, dialogues with countries making commitments against their national food system transformation pathway to achieve Agenda 2030. That outcome that they hope to achieve will come out of the work of the action tracks where a bold sales of multi-stakeholder commitments, actions and coalitions will emerge. Fourth, linked to um, the outcome three above, is vibrant communities talking to each other and supporting countries drive their food systems of transformation. Fifth is a follow-up mechanism that will be built on existing national, regional, or global mechanisms. So to get to these outcomes, the, the planning of this summit is steered by a very complex governance structure. This is because it's a special summit, it's not permanent within the UN systems. So when Antonio Guterres announced the convening of the summit in September, he also, um, appointed Dr. Agnes Kalibata as to be the special envoy 
to lead this summit. And with her deputy, Dr. Martin Frick, they receive guidance from um, a, an advisory committee that reports to the UN Deputy Secretary General, Ms. Amina Mohammed. This government structure is supported by a secretary that is headquartered in Nairobi, Kenya, and draws staff from different institutions um, and also the UN. Further, there are different structures in place that support the organizing of the summit. There, there is a scientific group of leading scientists chaired by Dr. Uh, Joaquin von Brown. There are five action tracks that drive the content of the summit. Each action track is led by a chair and a vice chair um, and also supported by a dedicated action track secretary team. And then there's a champions network. And um, this is a set of what they call accelerators who sort of have some convenient power that they can use to advance the food system cause and get people engaged and activated. And then there are what they're calling food system summit dialogues. Um, a number of you are must have been involved in this and you heard about the one we had in Gazo. And these are happening in, in all parts of the world that provide an opportunity for governments and communities to discuss their food systems and identify, way, identify ways that they can be strengthened. And then there's a the UN task force made up of different agencies within the UN. For stakeholder engagements, there are a number of groups that are also involved. There's a civil society group, there's an um, indigenous uh, people's group, and there's also a producers group. This is then all supported by a digital platform that is anchoring the communication, advocacy, and engagement work through service that some of you might be involved in, and an online engagement community. This entire mechanism is what um, supports the work that will be presented at the pre-summit in July and the summit in September. So this slide shows us um, the emerging patterns that are coming from the engagement held through the multiple structures I've just described in the previous slide. It is the consolidated ideas received by the NDA. And as you can see on my right side, the right side of my screen, and that the national dialogues held emerged as the big concern, no surprise here with COVID, and also to mention a few, building resilience and also advancing local production systems. When you go below, you see the independent dialogues, a strong focus on equity for affordable and nutritious food emerged. There's also a call for um, education on food systems. There's the call for uh, technology transfer and increased partnerships. And also um, the summit has been asked to really look at um, how we manage trade-offs. And if a transition it is needed, it must be a just one so that people are not left suffering under the imperative of changing our food systems. If we go over to the left side, under the action tracks, you'll see that there is, um, there is a call for creating food environments that enable people to access the food they need for their health and development. Um, there's also the, the call to produce within our planetary boundaries. Women empowerment is also a, a strong emerging um, theme and also a strong call for food safety. So from the feedback that was sourced and received under uh, the, with the first wave of propositions, gaps that were highlighted included the need to focus on the impact of COVID-19, to also look at the innovation, to look into innovation, and then also focus on um, smaller businesses. All this information is not being synthesized, including what has been received from the uh, second wave of ideas, is being synthesized into the areas in red in the middle, and, they, and, and that are imagined as the shared priorities. And all this will be captured into the um, Secretary General's um, call for action, excuse me. So in the next slide, in this slide, we'll look at how lifestyle has been captured in the action areas. And this is where content is really coming together. So the summit, like uh, the name already know, received over 200 ideas um, or propositions of what they call game-changing ideas under the first and second wave of idea generation. This one distilled into 100 big ideas that were consolidated into 15 action areas hosted under the action tracks with each action track um, having at least three action areas. For the livestock community, the areas highlighted in green is where we are seeing livestock being addressed. Under action area one, of course, under uh, making food safe and also access to nutritious food, 
Action area two around enabling healthy and sustainable food options. There is a solution in there around sustainable and healthy school meals for all children that may include livestock. Action area three, this is primarily where the, the issue of livestock is being addressed, focusing mainly on nature positive product, livestock production. And there's another solution around restoring grasslands. A just trans transition out of livestock is also being tackled under action area three. Under action area four, we have this whole issue around rebalancing agency. And there's a solution in here around capacity building, coming up with capacity building mechanism that may also capture livestock. And the action, uh, 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 and the action track five, the action area around food systems resilience may also have some livestock um, solutions in there. I need to mention at this point that there are two propositions that have been captured under action area two that may negatively, if I can say that, touch on livestock. There's a proposition on using public campaigns to challenge the masculine narrative imagined around um, meat. So that's one that will be captured under action area two. And then there's also a proposition to diversify the global protein supply via alternative proteins. So um, I'd like to mention here the entry points for engagement under the action tracks. So ILRI has some of its senior scientists supporting content generation as colleagues in some of the action areas and solution clusters that are sit under the action areas. Uh, we have uh, especially positioned scientists under action area one, action track one and action track three. And um, a couple of people also, one person also supporting action track five. These colleagues will be reaching out to dozen members. Some have already done so to support building out some of the solutions that have been suggested here. And then be part of what they're calling working groups, supporting content development. Another entry point will be around what the UNFSS is calling action coalitions. These are yet to be rolled out, but each solution cluster will have interested stakeholders asked to form co um, action coalitions committed to carrying forward the solutions generated. So again, there are two ways. You can be part of the working group co uh, generating content and or part of the action coalitions committed to carrying forward the work of the solution clusters. So um, this slide shows the journey to the summit. If you consider the summit uh, uh, as a pyramid, the foundation and the legitimacy of the summit is based on the feedback received from their wide consultations. They started off by actively listening and sourcing the changing solutions, of which they received around 2,000. They still listened to 100, about 100 big ideas and clustered this, them into 15 action areas to make them more manageable. Once these action areas have crystallized, there will be calls to rally behind these solutions captured within these action areas to be presented at the pre-summit and the summit thereafter. So going into the pre-summit in July and the summit in September, this diagram shows us a funnel how the summit secretariat is working to distill the substance of, of over a year of intensive engagements into a set of conclusions presented at the summit and amplified at the, presented at the pre-summit, sorry, and then amplified at the summit in September. And, and the amplification will come through a very bold statement that will be made by the Secretary General, some very strong commitments that will also come forward of action and a very clear follow-up mechanism. So the detail that sets apart what is expected at, this, uh, at the pre-summit and summit is captured on this slide. The overall goal of the summit is really just to consolidate the work that is coming for, is coming through with the over year engagements into a common vision and initiate, and initiate some commitments. The summit will then take this forward, coming, uh, will take this ambition forward with their very bold statement and many, much, and many more commitments, excuse me. The summit will crystallize the uh, Secretary General's um, statement of action into a two page high level statement that uh, will be annexed with all the rich ideas that will be coming out of the various engagements we'll be having. At the pre-summit, we'll have a few coalitions that will emerge and this will be further amplified at the summit. And then there'll be also some action commitments that will be made at the pre-summit 
and many more at the summit. So um, at, at, at the pre-summit, there will be an um, at the summit there will also be a, a follow-up mechanism that will be that will be put forward. So again, a, a quick glance at the engagement and uh, at how we can engage going forward. So the action tracks are requesting feedback for some of the game-changing propositions they received through the first and the second week. The figure on my uh, the right side of the screen is highlighting a portal that we can all go back, look at all the game-changing solutions and provide feedback. It would be a very good idea if some of us can get into there and send our feedback of what we think of the different areas of the different solutions coming forward. And then also, like I said before, when you're requested, someone may reach out to you to be part of the working group, developing the content of the solution clusters. And then also there'll be an opportunity to step up to be part of the action coalitions once they're announced, committing to take some of these um, actions coming out of the action track work forward. And then we can also engage in the ongoing, um, ongoing member state, um, ongoing dialogues, food systems, some dialogues. This will go on until August for the member, member state dialogues and also for the global and independent dialogues they'll go on until July, sometime mid July. Also, to be, we can be part of the ongoing public campaigns and push positive narratives about livestock, linking this towards going, the ongoing work on the UNFSS. It's also very important that we continue to share information internally and continue to talk in, talking among ourselves and also engaging of external, outside of the livestock community to the summit and beyond. This final slide captures some useful links, some useful links to the, uh, of some key documents, UNFSS documents and engagement platforms. So this will be made available to all for ease of access when um, these slides are shared. I'll stop here, Shirley, thank you, and happy to support Gazel and its members in future UNFSS activities. Thank you so much, Cynthia. I think we all have a great sense of the the opportunities, challenges, threats, all of the above, probably. Um, let me check, Eduardo, if we have any questions specific for Cynthia. Uh, surely no, no questions specifically for Cynthia, at least that I can see right now. Okay, great. So let me just say a couple of things to wrap up this little segment. Um, a big thank you to Walter and to Cynthia for helping to give us that big picture and lots of opportunities. Um, I would encourage you, if you have a moment, to go to the Coronivia uh, online site and look for the presentations uh, that came out of that livestock session last November. There's some really excellent um, presentations there, many from GASO members, we should be proud to say, I, I think, as well. Um, and uh, Cynthia, as she said, we will, from Ilri's side now, try to keep engaged when we see opportunities for GASO members to be engaged and swap ideas, provide knowledge and so on. This is gonna be very much an ongoing conversation. So Cynthia and Walter, many, many thanks for getting us excited about all the things that we can do and, and we can be involved in. Eduardo, before we move on to a few closing remarks from me, um, yes. Do you have any other questions, comments yes. that you think we should share at this point? Yes, I think we should give the opportunity to the audience to hear questions that were posed in the very beginning, and that for you know questions or time elapses we couldn't we couldn't address. From Fon Jackson in Canada, greetings to Fon. Uh, how can the stakeholders involved in Gasol help raise the voice of Gasol? I think that's what we've been hearing about. <laughs> I'm going to say something about that in my closing and, around and communication. Then, Let's, yes, I'm not going yes. to answer questions one by one at this point. <laughs> and then one, one, one question that has repeated from different persons is, how have we engaged dietitians and human nutrition experts? For me, my contact with human nutrition site provides me with rich and depth, in-depth information about value of animal source foods. This is Janet Helms from the US 
Greetings to Janet. Thank you for your question. Yeah, absolutely. And something that we explored earlier this week, those of you who saw the launch of a, of a paper on livestock derived foods and sustainable healthy diets was indeed led by a nutrition expert. And one of those things that we've said many times, let's do a better job of engaging, communicating with people who are not livestock specialists, but for whom livestock and all the dimensions around livestock are really, really important. Thank you so much for reminding us of that. And another one from Wilfred Leck. What is the message for large, large scale intensive livestock producers? I think it's the, for me, Nancy also commented nicely on this when I raised, uh, not the same point, but a similar point. All of us, whether we're small scale, large scale, yeah. pastoral or whatever, we've all got to do better, change, more sustainability, how you do that, what it looks like, how you communicate it, um, it's going to be very different depending on where you're starting from, as I always like to say. But I think all of us have to change. We have to commit to action. Um, but it's going to look very different. But let's keep the message. Livestock's engaged in these processes. Livestock matters for these processes. And we can all make mm -hmm. a difference there. And then if you give me a chance for a couple more uh, I have here from Dr. Brian Perry, greetings to Brian. I have noted that under the livestock umbrella, the growth of working equines in smallholder food systems has not received the attention that I suspect it deserves. Yeah, Brian, in fact, we do have an action network on animal welfare that does touch on that. It's led by Rebecca Doyle from University of Melbourne. And, and Rebecca's on maternity leave at the moment, and that's why it wasn't included in the action um, network program on uh, Wednesday, but she'd be back with us soon. So. Mm -hmm. And then from Ilse Koller Rolefson, thank you, Ilse, for your question. Uh, very pleased to hear about functional integrity being considered and adopted. I think it's a must considering planetary boundaries. Thanks for your comment, Ilsa. Definitely something we should consider as we as we move forward. So, mm -hmm. Eduardo, while I've got you here and on the screen, um, yes. I think this is a good opportunity for us all to say a huge thank you. Thank you so much, Eduardo, for all you've done for this Global Agenda multi-stakeholder meeting. Um, and we, we saw Fritz earlier, we've seen Peter and others who've been involved, but we hadn't seen your face. So, Asking you to do the questions was actually a ploy to make sure that we all see you uh, to say thank you as well. So many, many thanks. No, actually, it is my pleasure. And thank you to you and to everybody for the leadership and the support. It's been great working with all of you. Thanks. Excellent. Good. Now, just a few closing points from me, and I'll try and finish on time. Uh, it's my job to draw this week's global multi-stakeholder partnership meeting to a close. But I want to emphasize too, that it's the beginning of a journey that we will undoubtedly continue over the coming months. We've just touched on some aspects of that. For the global agenda itself, as we prepare the action plan for the coming three years, for the livestock sector, as it engages in these global processes that we've just heard about, and beyond those undoubtedly as well. And for each one of us, our organizations, because I hope you've been stimulated with new connections, new ideas, maybe not quite as many new connections as if we'd had a face-to-face -face meeting. And you're of course, welcome to use the material from this week for your planning, communicating, and so on with your own organizations and your constituencies, please do use it. And I can't help but reflect that our theme for the meeting, embracing change and harnessing diversity, has been so well emphasized and exemplified by all that we've shared this, this week. Nancy's presentation highlighted that very well. So I don't want to try and repeat what's been so excellently presented. Of course, one of the ways we've embraced change 
is in this new virtual world, not our first virtual meeting, but the first time we've used this kind of platform. And I hope you've found it a positive experience. We're going to look forward to hearing from everybody how they found that. I think we've all recognized and I hope been challenged as well that as with every sector, there does need to be change across the livestock sector towards more sustainability, inclusiveness, resilience, changes that look very different, as I just said, across the world, but nevertheless demand commitment to action from all of us, mitigate the negatives, strengthen the positives. And I do hope that GASL provides a forum to support, encourage, and coordinate that change across the livestock world and beyond. And as we heard when Nancy mentioned as well, the ability to measure that change, holding ourselves accountable, but also if we can measure it, we can communicate about it, both quantitative and qualitative. We've heard lots about collaborating more within the global agenda, sharing knowledge and so on, and beyond. But in doing so to make sure that all our diverse strengths, different resources, systems, species, people, culture are harnessed without losing the strength of our diversity. We don't all want to become looking exactly the same. We've heard the need to expand the diversity, more consumer interface, perhaps engagement with media, etc. And underpinning much of this challenge is to communicate more within GASL, beyond GASL, with other livestock and other agricultural entities, to non-livestock entities, and even to anti-livestock entities. I know that we need to strengthen this work as GASL plans go forward. And I think it means being much more intentional about communication and going beyond just communicating to engaging. We've got to make it multi-way and sometimes perhaps we'll get ourselves into difficult conversations. So we'll be taking these aspects and of course the details throughout the week into our planning in the coming months. Before I move on to some thanks, I just want to remind you of our mission, the Global Agenda's mission, because I think it also brings together nicely much of what we've been talking about. It says this, by 2030, sustainable, inclusive, resilient and diverse livestock systems across the world contribute significantly to the SDGs and are integral to sustainable food systems. That's a great aim, I think. Now, my task would be totally incomplete at this point without words of thanks. And of course, they are many. So I really hope I don't overlook anyone and I'll apologize in advance if I do. I've just mentioned Eduardo, the, the GASL manager, who's done a, a huge lot, and uh, Lavinia Scuderio, who's supported him, especially in the communications, and others in FAO in the support team. Peter Ballantyne and Fritz Schneider, really are the ones who put together the agenda and did an amazing job of engaging and preparing and facilitating. They followed up over with a huge lot of detail with presenters and panelists and participants and made sure nothing got overlooked. We had an executive committee, Eduardo, Henning Steinfeld, Fritz Schneider, Donald Moore, Nancy Bourgeois, Peter Ballantyne, and Michelle Sapin. Thank you all because you helped us review and refine and prepare what I think has been an excellent agenda. Thank you to the GASL Guiding Group who also input and approved and helped us to go forward with the plans for this week's meeting. Many, many thanks to all of you who've presented, who've joined panels, who've prepared an exhibition, who've engaged in the discussion, shared through blogs and social media, or you've participated and you've got your head buzzing with ideas you want to go back and share with your colleagues. Thank you all for your preparation, for your time, for your energy. Let's keep it up. I want to thank Switzerland and France, the Jura region, for your readiness, the endless changes in preparations, and finally, virtual engagement. And of course, your continued support for the core funds of the Global Agenda, along with those of Netherlands, the Gates Foundation, Ireland, 
CNE and GDP, and the many others who contribute financially to Action Networks and to each and every person who contributes in one way or another, in kind, in, in different contributions. We really recognize and value each and every one. Let me thank our very patient interpreters. You've done a great job. I don't, I'm not aware that anybody got lost and that's also attributed to you. And thanks to, to the team from the virtual show who've perhaps had to be even more patient than the interpreters. To George and George and George and Vanya, those are the names I know, but I know you've had a huge team uh, behind the scenes. We've had endless requests, little changes, um, and you've been incredibly patient with us and very, very responsive. Really, really appreciate that. Just to let you all know as we close that the platform itself will be open for another 30 days. So right up to the 10th of July, you can go back as you have been doing to enter this conversation. You can listen to any of the recordings through just clicking on the date and finding the session you're interested in. And you can continue to explore the booths in the exposition. So if you missed any of that, it's still there right up to the 10th of July. Thank you all for being part of this this week. Do continue to stay safe, continue to be part of the livestock sector going forward and to engage as we reach out to you as well as we work on our plans for Gazel going forward. Thank you so much. <laughs>